The name of this message, if it had one, would be the old prophet and the young prophet. I want to talk to you about the old prophet and the young prophet. And before we do that, I have to give a little bit of background about one of the players in this story, and that's Jeroboam. Now, you may not have heard of Jeroboam. I'm sure you have. He's very prominent in the Old Testament. And you see many times it talks about the sin of Jeroboam, his great sin. Jeroboam did a lot of damage to Israel, not sometimes in the way we think. So let me give you a little bit of background of Jeroboam. So Solomon, Solomon was a king after his father David. He was a king of peace, right? David was a king of war. Yep. Then there's a king of peace. You always have the kings of war, then the kings of peace. Amen. You know, when I first got saved, the Lord was moving many years ago, as I believe he's beginning to stir and move again. The Lord was moving. There was a lot of kings of peace. There was a lot of men that were just overnight, you know, looking at a congregation of 500 people, 1,000 people, 2,000 people, large budgets, everything. God was blessing. But as I grew in the Lord and knew my even recent Christian history, I began to realize there were men of war, men, and some little outside little church, Pentecostal church or Baptist church, really getting a hold of God and praying, seeking God the way we've been doing here on Friday nights, really getting a hold of the Lord so that things, there could be men of peace. Do you understand that? David couldn't build the, temp, the, the house of the Lord. He wasn't a builder. Today we're filled with builders. I'm telling you, it overwhelms me that preachers can tell you how to build and to budget and all this. It's like, you know, because we're in the time of builders. But we need time again of warriors, man, of men who will fight. Men pay the price. So we just see that Solomon was a king over a time of peace. It was okay. It's what was God's timing. And there was a servant that he had. His name was Jeroboam. And in 1 Kings eleven twenty eight. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man, that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. So Solomon saw that this young man, he, he was vigorous and he was industrious. One translation of the Bible says he could get things done. Now that's a good trait, but it's not necessarily meaning someone's call to do exactly what God wants. Amen? We need to be careful of that. You can be industrious. I was a very industrious young man. I, like I said, I bought my first house when I was 21. I was in business at 22. I had 15 employees at like 23, 24. Very industrious. God can use that after he breaks it. Amen? So God had to just break me and break me and take so much away from me so that I could be industrious in the spirit. But today we're quick to say, I need to be industrious. That's why I say, as far as elders around me, I'm not looking for some businessman that's successful. I'm looking for some broken man. Some broken man. And maybe he's walking in victory now, but I want to see that brokenness. Amen? So this is the story of where Joel... Jeroboam comes into our view as he's a servant for the Lord. I mean, for Solomon. And Solomon knew he could get things done. Yes? But Solomon had not been following the Lord the way that he wanted. And so the prophet comes and he tells Jeroboam later on that he's going to take the tribes away from Solomon's son, Jeroboam. And he's going to take ten tribes away, but he's going to let Rareboam keep one tribe because God's judgment is coming. So the prophet comes and he finds Jeroboam and he tells him this. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going to bless your house. You're going to rule over these ten tribes. But I'm going to leave a remnant for David in Rareboam, right? I'm going to leave a remnant for David. What we're seeing here <clears throat> is what we've talked about where there's a testimony of, 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 of Samuel and he anoints David and you've got David. Then you've got David's son. It's true. Solomon made some mistakes. But he had that history, amen? He knew to look back. He had a heritage. And slowly that heritage is being lost. As we see that even in America, the heritage of what America's about has been lost. The heritage of real Christianity, of the cross and paying the price and getting a hold of Jesus is being lost, right, as we continue to go on. So these things are beginning to be lost. And so when Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam takes the throne. But Rehoboam acts foolishly. And he acts foolishly in 1 Kings 12. So now he's king. Solomon is dead. He's king. And in 1 Kings 12, 6, 
King Rehoboam consulted the old men that stood before Solomon his father while they yet lived, and he said, How do you advise that I may speak to this people? And they said, If you will be a servant to this people this day and will serve them and answer them and speak them good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. Verse 8, But he forsook the counsel of the old men which had, they had given him and consulted with the young men that he grew up with, which stood before him. So as we go through this, we're going to see that it's important how you listen and how you hear. We have to have an ear to hear what the Lord is saying is doing. So here's this young man. Now, there's nothing wrong with being young on the throne. There's nothing wrong with even being young and zealous in the Lord. Yeah, but you need that counsel. Amen. When I first got saved and I was in a larger church, very large church that God had been moving in and the Jesus people thing, how exciting it was. But after that, God took me out and he put me into a smaller church. And I began to go out on the streets, as you know, and preach the gospel. That's where my ministry started, was out on the streets. And I began to attend this other church. And I, God showed me. I remember was I was in my bedroom praying, reading the book of Timothy. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you're a Timothy. You need a Paul. Like, you don't need to be out there on your own. So I went to this pastor and I said, God spoke to me and said, I'm a Timothy. And I need a Paul. And you're it. And it was good for me. So I had someone to to get counsel from, someone to talk to. Yep. You heard me share that testimony just the other week that the first time he came out with me on the streets, he stood behind me and I began to preach. And the next day he told the congregation, he said, I was going to go out and preach with Frank, but he stood there and began to preach and the anointing was on him. So I knew this is his ministry. But many a time while I was preaching out on the streets, I would look across the street and there'd be his car. He would come out there, pray for us, just watch over us. It was good for me. As a young man, as I said, I never forget, forgot, will forget the time that I went into him, lesson I learned. And uh, he said, how's it going? What are you going to be doing this weekend with the ministry on the streets? And, and I was just a businessman, young businessman. I didn't even know I had a ministry. We were just out there preaching. And I said, oh, I'm going out of town. Some of you have heard me relate this. And he looked at me and said, has God given you permission to go out of town and not be there this weekend? I'm telling you, it sounds funny, but it struck me so hard. Like Peter almost had to go away and weep because it convicted me so strong. I know we're not used to that today because that kind of conviction isn't around us enough. But I was so convicted that I was even thinking about leaving that parking lot for one week without God's permission. And I can tell you that I did not step off that parking lot on a Friday night for a year and a half till God gave me the release. So it was good to have this man in my life, Right? To have that counsel. And this is what Rehoboam needs. He needs that counsel. Amen? You know, if someone says, I've heard God and I don't need to listen to anyone, that's someone who's stubborn. But somebody says, I've heard God and of course I'll get counsel. Amen? Because they, they're sure they've heard God and they know things can be added to that. Amen? If you've really heard God, then, then you need to stick with that. But then you're not afraid of getting any counsel. Amen? You're not afraid of hearing the Lord. So Rehoboam needed that kind of, he needed that kind of counsel. He needed those old men in his life. When we were young in the Lord, there was a time where I began to see this need and I began to pray, Lord, put some older men in my life. Now, I'm not saying that it was, it was all like this because there's, there's, there's a lot of lovely men in the Lord, but it was hard for me to find the older men that I was looking for. I would sit with some pastors and they would tell me how to raise money. I said, that's not what I need. Or I'd tell them how I was getting on planes with one-way ticket. And instead of giving me some counsel like, are you paying attention to your family or this? You could see they were just shocked. Like, how can you do that? And I'm like, the Bible says to do that, right? So I was looking, and then that's where God began to put books in my hands. He also put some men that we could begin to get some counsel from, David Wilkerson and men like that. But he began to put books in my hands. That's how I discovered A.W. Tozer so much and T.L. Austin. Uh, uh, T. Austin Sparks and, and Oswald Chambers and, and all these other men that, that I began to read because I knew I need that kind of wisdom. I knew I was on fire and I knew I was dangerous. Amen? And I didn't want somebody to put that fire out. But it's not wrong getting that counsel. But Rehoboam makes a mistake. The old men, they tell him, if you'll be a servant. See, there's that humility. It doesn't mean they're always right. Yeah? But there's that looking to that other generation. Amen? When my uh, co-worker Pete and I would, we discovered about 
God's order and stuff. Before we went on any trip, we went to my father's house. My father had a very simple faith. He got saved when I did. But we'd always go to his house and say, Dad, we're going on a trip. Would you pray for us? And he wouldn't give us advice or counsel. In some ways, I was ministering to my dad a lot. But whatever he prayed, that's what happened. If he said, God, provide for this trip, God provide. If he said, God, protect him, we'd find us ourselves in a dangerous situation. He'd protect us. So we learned that. Now, once again, these things are lost because we don't have the natural, the natural shadows of them. Amen? Because so many are growing up without that fatherhood. Amen? Without those parents in their lives. They don't understand that. We find it difficult to make decisions. Amen? Yeah? People struggle and struggle. Like, just make a decision. Just this is what God wants to sign. We help our children make decisions, don't we? You need to go upstairs and clean your room. No! Okay, the child has made a decision. It might not go well with them. I'm going to help them make a better decision. You see? Now, we don't like that today because we want more understanding, more of this and more of that. And I'm telling you, it doesn't serve us well. It's time the church wake up to that. We can, we can have meetings and talk about fatherhood and manhood all we want. But until we have meetings where we say, listen, gentlemen, would you please start doing that? Start being that man God wants you to be. And amen. And thank God for all the men that are doing that. But Rehoboam, he has this because it says the old men that were with Solomon. So in other words, these are men who remember. They might not have everything perfect, but they remember when the glory cloud came into Solomon's temple. They remember David. They remember some of those heritage things. Amen. And they said, if you'll be a servant, it's not what Jesus said. If you're going to be a, a leader in the kingdom, you have to be a servant. If you'll be a servant, these people will serve you. But he rejects that counsel. And he goes to the young men that he grew up with. And it's been my experience to see, even, even in the re recent years, there's a lot of young men, even Christian young men, growing up in Christianity. And, they, and it's, 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 youth is like that, where you think you know everything. But these men, they talk among themselves. They decide what they're doing, but there's not any real counsel. Amen? How many of y'all heard of Keith Green and you were blessed by some of his music? Amen? Can't you see? Can't you see all the people sinking down? Don't you know? Don't you care if they brown? Don't you know what those are? Those are messages that Leonard Ravenhill preached. A lot of the songs he sang were simple messages that ones like Wilkerson preached. I mean, uh, Ravenhill preached or even Wilkerson. Because he was on fire, but he had enough sense to go and sit in Ravenhill's prayer meetings. So he rejects that and he goes to these young men and what are they telling him? They say, this is what you tell the people. You say, if your father's, your father's rule was like a little finger, you're going to be like, you're going to be, you're going to be like the, the torso of a man. That you're, if you think your, your, your father ruled over them, you're going to roll over there even harsher. Because they were like, this is what you do. See, they didn't understand authority. We're, oh, Ryan's not here this morning. His family's not well. Yep. Or Ryan would be saying in authority and under authority. These men understood about being in authority and under authority. These young men did not. So they said, look, you just, this is what you tell them. As I told you before, this is what happened. As I said, even when COVID hit, we didn't have leaders who were saying, hey, let's all work together as Americans. Hey, let's pray. Hey, what should we do? Right away, it was like, this is what you're doing. This is how you're going to do it. Because these are leaders that don't understand authority. And when you get people that don't understand it, they're harsh. Yeah. That's why when, when, when even sister will say, yeah, I need to submit to my husband, but he better do what God said, and he better, and it's like, listen, listen, I'm not even, I'm not even going to talk, talk about that. That man needs to be submitted to God. Amen? Amen? Any man that's going to go home says, I'm the head of this house. Are you? Are you find out you start off by being the head of your house by being on your knees and saying, God, what do you want from me? Amen? If I'm asking her to follow me somewhere, and thank God this little lady here has followed me through the craziest things you can imagine, it's because God has spoke to me first. Amen? So when he goes out there and he tells them, this is what I'm going to do, everybody said, up and to your house. He lost them all. They began to just rebel against him. And when they did, they began to run to Jeroboam because God's law was coming to pass, was it not? I mean, God's word is coming to pass that God was going to divide the kingdom. Now, God divided the kingdom and most of the people went with Jeroboam and a remnant of them went with Rehoboam because God's going to have a remnant that he promised to David because his word is true. Amen. His word is true. And Jeroboam, what his real sin was, 
It says he answered the people roughly and forsook the old man's counsel that they had given him. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. Now in, Je- in 1 King 12, Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the people return unto the house of David. Now here's, here's Jeroboam's sin. You want to see his terrible sin? Was his sin was, he's got these people. He's got these ten tribes. He's got all these people he wants. He's got more people than Jeroboam. But he has an insecurity. And that insecurity is, they're going to leave me and they're going to go return back to Jerusalem because that's where the sacrifice needs to be. Yeah? There's too much politics in Christianity. Amen? You look when Jesus came. What did they say? He's going to take away our temple and take away our nation. That's all they cared about. They had built something. You have to be careful how you build. If you build so much where you're afraid that it's going to go, then you're going to curtail everything to keep that together. Can't do that. You got to build spiritually, amen? You got to do it God's way. And he had an insecurity. Because this is what you get to when, when the authority of Christ wanes. This is what we get to even in America. You can see the leadership. Sometimes on both sides. We don't have, we don't have men that understand that. Now politicians are politicians, amen? Their life is, is, is made for compromise. That's what they have to do, Right? That's why it's it's hard or impossible for a Christian to really hold office because they have to compromise. But that's their job. But at least we had men in the past, men who had been generals in the army, men who at least grown up and knew some kind of authority. Now we have men that just want to rule and reign. All they care about is power. And this is what happened to, to Rehoboam. He was industrious. He could get things done, but he had an insecurity in his heart. Amen that God wanted to deal with. God had to deal with it. So he said, they're going to go back to Jerusalem. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell them you don't have to go back. Now this is important. Because what's the foundation of our faith? Jesus, amen? Jesus. It's got to be founded on Jesus Christ and His Lordship, amen? We can't present anything else for people to be a part of. We can't have a Christianity of convenience like we have today that says, hey, you can be your own Lord. You can be your own boss. You can live your life and call Him Savior. You don't have to, you don't have to worship on the ground of, of the cross of Jesus Christ. It doesn't have to be Jerusalem. Tell you what, people, it's got to be on the ground of Jerusalem. It's not wrong to build, but I'll tell you what, It's hard to build. No, it's not hard to build. You get a band, you get a budget, you get a building. That's what people have told me. That's how you build. Man, you got to build slow and you got to build sure. Amen? Because that character is what's most important. He was a valiant man and he was industrious. Is that enough? Where's the character? Their character was missing in his life. So what did he do? He built two golden calves. And he said, worship here. Now, it doesn't seem like that's that horrible a sin. You'd say, what about Ahab? What about some of these other kings? Murder was in their their repertoire. But God takes so seriously that we move off the ground of Jesus, 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 Jesus. Amen? You can talk about Jesus. You can talk about the things he did. You can write books about about. Uh, trying to be like Jesus, although I disagree with that. As I've said, it's not, it's not Im- imitation, it's identification. We have to identify with Him. But it's something completely to preach the person of Jesus. The person of Jesus is here, amen? He is here by the Holy Ghost. Is that not right? He's at the right hand of the Father, but His presence is here. He is here by the Holy Ghost. And everything has to bow to that. This is so important because... What we're seeing is a kingdom in decline. And if you have to pay attention to this because we can talk about politics and you can talk about what's going on or even eschatology and end time things. But if you don't really see the heart of our step by step by step. Falling away from what God wants, it's important. Every step we keep going smoother, moving further and further from him and more and more in to one world government, more and more in 
to one world religion. You don't see that in America, but when I was overseas, let me tell you who persecuted us. Eschat the the, the, uh, the uh, ecclesiastical churches. The unity of the churches. That's who came against us. Actually, some of the lost people stood up for us. So these are good people. But when we said, we're going to follow the Holy Ghost, they said, no, no, this is the way the church goes. This is the way unity goes. This is the way we all do this. And I'm like, yeah, but i got to follow the Holy Ghost. It's coming here. The more there's a divide between those who really love Jesus and those who just want his name. And he made these golden calves and people worship him. We say, well, we don't have golden calves in America. We absolutely do. We bow down the golden calf of entertainment, the inter- of sports, of money, all these things. Of success. We love success. I told, I told a, uh, another preacher on Wednesday night, precious brother who came into our meetings hanging on to what God wants him to hang on. I said, well, brother, don't be discouraged because there's one thing that, that, that people will not put up with. They'll put up with all kind of stuff. Preachers can compromise. Preachers can, can live an opulent lifestyle, but they'll never put up with the preacher who's not successful. Can't have that. We worship at those, those golden calves. And it's wrong. And that's where these people were at. And that's the sin of Jeroboam. You'll see it again and again in the Bible. I want you to to remember that. God will say, because of the sin of Jeroboam, you think, Lord, that was a couple of generations ago. Are you still upset about that? Yes, because this is what he doesn't want. You think about that. With all the teachings we have, the most important thing we need is this. Are you on the ground of Jesus, on the person of Jesus? Do you love Jesus this morning? Do you look to Jesus this morning? Do you know he's there? Do you realize you can never imitate enough to be like him, but you can bow your knee and you can know I can identify with him. Therefore, I'm in him and he's in me and I'm going to make it. Amen. You know, that's why we start with my counseling, if you want to call it. Somebody struggling so bad, I always start with, are you saved? And sometimes they'll be upset at me like, Brother Frank, you know I'm saved. It's like, okay, let's start there. Christ lived inside of you. Brother Frank, you know he lives in me. Okay. Then God Almighty lives in you. I know he lives in me. Okay, well, we're going to start there because now we know you're going to make it. You've got all these other problems, and we've got to find what the Holy Ghost wants for that because I don't have, you know, a 500-pound counseling book on how to get you straight. We're going to find out. But Christ in you, amen? Somebody say amen. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It just give you hope this morning. And keep you from judging others. That brother, sister, look how much messed up they are. What I want to know is, are they really saved? Yes. Then Christ lives in them. The house may be a little messed up. The rain may be coming in the roof. The doors may be broken off a little bit. But he or she's going to make it. Amen? Because Christ lives in them. Christ lives in them. It's what God wants. Amen? This was the bad advice that they got. Praising. Then in 2 Kings, this is, can we get to the meat of our story now? You, you understand Jeroboam a little bit? So Jeroboam's at the altar. He's worshiping at the altar. And a prophet, who's this prophet? We don't know. What's his name? We don't know. That's, that's something interesting about prophets like Elijah. Elijah, he showed out of, you know, 1 Kings 17, he just shows up. Who are you? See, people, we don't understand men like that. Where's your credentials? God's called me. So he shows up and he cries against the altar. He cries against the altar. He said, God's going to raise up a king, Josiah. And on this altar, they're going to burn the bones of false prophets. So he cries against that altar. Yeah, this is no message. This is a cry. Sometimes God has to have men that have a cry. Amen. It's nice to have preaching. It's nice to have teaching. Paul said, I'm an apostle, a teacher, a preacher. All that's good. But sometimes we need a cry. How many of you think America needs a cry now? We need a cry. Repent. Get back to God. There's got to be a cry. And he cries against the altar. And he says, says, this will be the sign. This altar will will be broken. And immediately... Immediately, Jeroboam says, get that man. He reaches out to him. I'm paraphrasing, but he reaches out to him. He's angry. That's his first response, which is always wrong. 
How many of you know that when someone tells you that, whether it's the word of God, another brother says something, you hear a message and right away it's like there's anger rises up in you. That's a, that's a, a, an indication right there is like, maybe it touched something. Yeah. Maybe it touched something in my life. And so he reaches out for him. And when he does, his arm is shriveled up. Don't ever reach out for God's man. Amen. He reaches out for him and his arm is shriveled up. And he asked the prophet, please pray for me that my arm would be restored. And the prophet prays for him and his arm is restored because we have a loving God. Amen. God is constantly reaching out, even to Jeroboam. But he's not listening because he's not listening to the word of God. And when he's done, he tells this young prophet, listen, come back and I'll give you a reward and I'll give you something to eat and I'll give you something to drink and you can have some rest. And the young prophet says, God told me not to stop, not to have drink, not to eat, not to take any reward. This is what God told me. So he knows what God spoke to him. And then he leaves. You know, you always have to be careful never to take a reward. Is that not right? Remember Elijah and his servant? When Nahum washed in the pool, the leper and was healed, and he wanted to give the prophet a reward, and he said, if you give me half, half of what you have, I can't take it. We need men like that again. Yeah? We're so worried about it. This is what we saw with COVID and all that. Everybody's so worried. What if people leave or don't come back? What are we going to do with their budget? What if they don't come back? Maybe they didn't want God. Do you know what I'm saying? I know this sounds unkind, but this field church, this city's filled with churches. They can go to loads of churches in this city and go in and out and hear a nice message, get their ears tickled, and it's fine. And they'll get, if they got a ticket to heaven, that's fine. But if you want to go deeper with God, it's something different. This prophet says, look, I don't want your reward. But his servant chased after him. And he said, oh, you know, Elijah, he's had some visitors come. And he was wondering if you could give him some clothes and some money to help the visit. Because if he knew he went and said Elijah asked for a reward, Nahum would know better. So he gave it to the servant. And when the servant came back, Elijah said, where you been? I, I, I've been nowhere, but God, God's man knows. He said, I saw you when you ran after him. Is this a time? This is so important. Is this a time? He tells him, when the man returned from the chariot to meeting, he said, is it a proper time to accept money and clothing and olive orchards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female servants? Is it a time? I ask you now, is it time in America for us to worry about how, how our budgets are doing? Is it time in America to build, worry about maybe adding another campus? Is, is it time in America to try to, to go and in, 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 in to increase what we're doing? I told Brother Larry we were on the phone yesterday when I was talking to another preacher And this was a good man I was talking to. I said, Larry, you know what impressed me about him? He didn't tell me what he was doing. I meet Christians, they right away, they start rattling off. I'm doing this and this and this and this. And I'm like, I don't, I'm blessed you're doing all that. But I want to know, I want to know you. I'd like to fellowship with you. But we've become so works orientated. We don't like to be just sitting still saying, what do you want, God? So he said, the leprosy that was on Nahum is now on you. And his servant became leopard as white as snow. Isn't that awful? It's terrible. Because the king wanted him to come and refresh himself. And he couldn't do it. First King 13, 11, you still with me? Now there was an old prophet in Bethel. This is an old prophet. And his sons came and told him everything that the man and God had done that day in Bethel. And they also told their father the words that he had spoken to the king. So they told him the words he had spoken to the king. So there's this old prophet. Things are in declension. Do you understand that? You have to take the word of God in the, in the context it's in also. David's gone. Solomon's gone. Rehoboam's not listening to the good counsel. The kingdom's divided. Things are, things are difficult. And then you have this old prophet. He's an old prophet. Didn't say he was a wise prophet, but he was an old prophet. And his sons came and told him all that the young prophet did. It probably stirred things in him of things from the past, right? But we can't live in the past, amen? I've seen even headlines at times like, it's going to be like the Jesus people movement, and God's going to move like this again. It's like, I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for what God's going to do right now, amen? I can sit here and tell stories 
of, of adventure and faith that my wife and I and Anthony and we've walked through three years. And there's some validity in that for a testimony. But it doesn't do any good for what God wants right, right now. Amen? What's He doing right now? What's God doing right now? So they come and tell him, they say the words that the prophet, young prophet said. So this old prophet knew that he said, I will not eat bread. I will not drink water. I cannot stop. God said, go do this. I have to do it. And in 1 Kings 13, 8, he answered and said, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me the word of the Lord saying, bring him back to your house so that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. Shocking, isn't it? Come on, you can't have a prophet lie. You most certainly can. When things are on the wrong ground, all kind of things are going on. This is a time when the, when the kingdom is filled with the wrong things. I've said it again and again. There's times that I, I think back when, when, when we'd be listening to, to Tozer or Ravenhill or some of these men, and the conviction would be so strong. These men were railing against sin in the church. And I tell my wife, but baby, that was 40 years ago. So either the church is completely pure or we're in trouble. Or we're in trouble. You see, we're not convicted about God told me this. We're, we're still fighting over like, can you be drunk? Can you do this? Can you do that? The real conviction ought to be, God spoke to my heart this morning to do this and I didn't do it. We should be weeping over that. But we're not used to that. So he comes and he says, an angel came to me. Now, this, you have to be careful with this. I believe in angels. They're ministering flames of fire. But I'm always leery. I've been around long enough that every once in a while in, in Christianity, people start writing books about angels and talking about angels and all this stuff about angels starts coming out. And I believe in angels. But I also know that it says in Colossians to be careful of those who, who give you will worship. In other words, out, outward worship. Right? Of denying yourself and stuff. And they're talking about the worship of angels. Amen. You don't worship angels. Is that right? I remember being a very young preacher. And this, this preacher is very famous, very rich, very powerful man. And he was, he was teaching. I was a baby baby. And he was teaching how you can command God. Because it says in the Old Testament, command ye me. Really, that's God looking at his children saying like a father, are you going to tell me what to do? But we were, th these preachers were taking the word of God. You can command the angels. You can do this. I mean, I hadn't been saved but a few weeks. I'm thinking, this is interesting. I got up in the middle of the night. I couldn't sleep. And I was thinking about what he said. And I was going to open my mouth and talk to God. And the fear of God permeated that whole house. Like, you're fixing to step into things you have no business in. Yeah. We don't go trying to tell angels what to do or do this or do that. This is why I said an angel told me. He's an old prophet. He knew better than to say, God told me. An angel told me. There's a lot, of, a lot of foolishness can be out there, amen? When you really see something from God, you don't talk about it too quickly, do you? I go by Paul's words. I knew a man 14 years ago caught off into the third heaven. Whether in the spirit or out of the spirit, I don't know. But he saw things and heard things that you cannot utter. I'm always leery when somebody's like, this is the best-selling book. This person died and went to heaven. They saw this and they wrote this book and they're making all this money off of it. I'm not, dis I'm not disputing anybody's experience, but I'm saying that, you know, you, you, when you meet somebody that's really met God, they're not like, we're going to write a new book on how Jesus and I went in a car ride together and God told me all this stuff. I'm just leery. That's all I'm saying. Because Paul couldn't talk about it. What did Paul say in Colossians, Galatians? He said he was so sure about the word he delivered them. He had delivered them the sure word of God, the revelation of Jesus. This is a sidestep just for a moment, if I may. If you look at Paul and you look at 1 John and you look at Jude, these guys fought for the gospel, amen? Can you please forgive me that I fight a little bit for the gospel? That they, didn't, they, they were constantly trying to put the people back on Jesus. And Paul told them, he said, if I come to you or an angel comes to you, don't you believe anything but what we told you at the beginning. That's amazing, isn't it? Because the Word of God supersedes angels. Amen? The Word of God is sure and clear. And we're losing that. Amen? We're in, we're in a Christianity that says, well, God, God made a suggestion to me. Did He really? God made a suggestion? If I asked my son to do something when they were growing up, it was never a suggestion. Would you like to come help me? 
It was never a suggestion. I meant what I said. God means what he says. And a lot of what's going on today in, the, in, in, in people's struggles. And yes, we have an enemy. Amen. And yes, he comes against us. But so many times it's because we're not listening to God. But we think it's okay. Amen. Because that's the way even this generation is raised. The parent asks the child to do something. They say no. The parent discusses with them. Everything's fine. They go on their way. I wouldn't raise that way. Yeah. There was consequences. Somebody say amen. Some of you know that. That's not a bad thing. That consequence is right there. My mom would tell me something to do. I'd say, I don't think so. Immediate consequence. Immediate. She had seven boys. She knew if I don't have an immediate consequence, these, these, these prisoners are going to take over the asylum. Now, I'm not bringing this up. I'm not trying to teach you about child rearing. And people can say, well, Brother Frank, why are you going to? I'm trying to tell you that that's in a natural way and we've lost it in the kingdom. Amen. We've lost it in, in the kingdom of God. So he says, listen, an angel spoke to me. And this young man, he, he's, he's naive. He's a good young man. He did what God said. He cried against the altar. That took some guts, didn't it? He cried against the altar. He didn't worry what they had to say. But, but he gets to see by the word of God. I mean, not by, by, by this man about the word of God. Paul said, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you that which been preached to you, let him be accursed. Wow. These are Paul's words. Let him be accursed. And then people get upset today when you say, well, these people love God and those people love God and they're doing this and they're doing everything's fine. It's like, you know, are they worshiping Jesus? Are they bowing to Jesus? Are they relying on the blood of Jesus? Are they knowing you must be born again by the Spirit of God? Well, no, they add these other parts and it's okay. It's like, no. We've got to stick with what God says. Amen. 1 King 13, 20, it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet that brought him back. And he cried to the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as you have disobeyed the mouth of God, has not kept the commandment which he, the Lord God, commanded you, but came back and ate bread and drank water in this place of which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread, drink no water. Your carcass shall not come to the sepulchres of your fathers. Wow. This is... This is... This is interesting scripture, isn't it? You could almost stumble with this. You know how you don't stumble? He's Lord. Amen? That's how you don't stumble. Yeah? Now, some people would question my sanity today, but I tell you that it's, there have been times when it's borderline, but what kept me sane was this. He's king. Tragedy strikes, run through my family or something. It's like, he's king. Not, not, not turning your brain off, not just... Not just uh, an, an unthinking man's faith, but knowing I can see all this natural things going on, but I know one thing, he's the king and he's right. And he's right right here, amen? You see, when people see this and they see that the young prophet is now going to come under God's judgment, now he's not lost. You'll probably, you're going to meet him in heaven. He's a good man, but he's, he's failed in what God has called him to do. When we read that, the first thing that comes into many people's hearts is unfair because that's the world we live in where everything's unfair. Everything's unfair. I'm not as tall as I want to be. I'm not as short as I want to be. I'm too wide. I'm too skinny. I'm not smart enough. I'm a man. I'm a woman. Everybody's upset about what's going on. What it should put is the fear of God in our hearts. Here's my first reaction. Oh, Lord God, have mercy on my soul. How many times have you spoke to me and maybe I didn't listen? And here I am. Somebody, can you remember last week? Can you see how God, God's doing things? Last week we saw Brother Peter. Have you been thinking about Brother Peter? Denies the Lord, yet he's standing there down the Pentecost because he's, he's in a better promise and a better covenant. Now, has our God changed? No. Our God still expects His Word to be obeyed. But He's got the Holy Spirit to lead us on our way. Somebody say amen. You see, this is what should pr produce humility in us. Instead of, and so many times it produces an arrogance. Well, I don't know if I want to serve this God. Can we get a different translation that says that this guy didn't get in trouble? No. Could we find a preacher to explain it away? No. It's simply this. God means what He says, period. 
And then we meet the grace of God. Somebody say amen. Glory to God. I read this story and I'm like, oh, Lord, God. And the, the, the old prophet, see, he still has the gift. The callings and gifts are without repentance. Is that true? He's got a gift. You know, a man can have a gift. That's why some people don't understand. Well, I, I, people will talk to me. Our preacher was preaching so good. Then we found out he had an affair with this woman. We just don't understand. Well, he had a gift. And God gave it to him. But where's the character? Amen? That's something I discovered when I was a young man, too. That's why we asked for older men, because I realized, Lord, I can be in meetings. Man, there would be power everywhere. The anointing of God everywhere. But I know, Lord, I've got to have something deep inside. Yeah. You can be Superman and go out there and save the world and then come slap your wife around. God ain't happy. Amen. Character. Character. It takes time. It takes work. It takes brokenness. God gives us that in the New Testament. Somebody say, man, I'm telling you, it just makes, we could just stop right here and just worship for a while. Thank you, God. I haven't met a line in the last few days. So the old prophet then looks at in this crazy story. First, the prophet lies to him and tells him he, got, he met an angel, that an angel talked to him. Then they're eating. Everything's fine. The young man's there like, well, I guess God, you know, God changes his mind. God alters what he said. It's okay. And then the prophet wakes up and he says, you didn't do what God said. What a crazy story. Our God means what he says. Amen. Do you belong to him this morning? Is he your father? I love you. See that difference of that? How many of you? I tell you what, when I grew up, my father meant what he said. I never questioned that he didn't love me. Well, maybe when I was younger, some of you too, at times you would think, man, I think this man doesn't love me. But as you grow, you learn. Do you see how we have a whole generation that doesn't understand that? And yet, they're getting saved, and thank God, or it looks like they're getting saved, and maybe they are, and they're coming in. And I'm telling you, it's got to be the work of the Holy Spirit. No class is going to do it. It's not wrong to have a class, not wrong to have a Bible study. Oh, we may do some of those things, but you've got to have the Holy Ghost and the, and the character to begin to do it. Amen? This is where you learn. So when he leaves... He's met by a lion, and a lion kills him. And it says that the, the donkey he's on is standing there, the body's there, and the lion's there. Why is that? People could come by and see it. There's the prophet. There's the lion. There's the donkey. How come the lion isn't tearing the body? How come the lion isn't eating that donkey? Because it seems to me, you and I have a choice. But the, the animals, they're under his subjection. Amen? Just like that donkey that told Balaam, why are you beating me all these times? Yeah, the shocking things that Balaam talked back to him. What do you mean? You've been, you've been, you've been uh, angry with me. I mean, uh, disobedient to me. I thought it was interesting he was talking to a donkey because who was the stubborn one there? Because, you know, in Spanish, when, when, when I'm down in Honduras, we'd, Oscar and I were talking, it'd be like, I use the term bonehead or stubborn. There's not a word for that. You know what they say? Burro. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Burrow. How many of you are stubborn? Don't put your hands up. I don't, I don't need to see them. But we can be stubborn. Amen? But we have a Father who loves us. So that lion did exactly what he was told to do. Just like that, that fish that swallowed Joe, uh, uh, the prophet jo uh, Jonah. So the lion did exactly what he's told to do. A tragic story. A tragic story, but that's why we did the background for you to see. We're living in those times where people can be like, well, if God spoke to you, and, and he's got to know he spoke to you. I mean, he can speak to you out of this word. He can speak to you in a dream. He can speak to you in a meeting like this. He can speak to you when your brothers are in there together, you sisters are praying. He can speak to you. But we've lost that because we've got so down to like, just teach the Bible. The Bible says, don't, I think Christians tell me God doesn't speak anymore. It says in the word, don't steal, don't murder, don't do these, be nice to people. We have the word, but how do you hear in your day to day? What do you know what God is telling you to do? Because that word's got to be alive, amen? We've talked a lot about that because we, we have to learn to hear the Holy Spirit. And when you know he speaks to you, you need to obey. Amen? When you get to that point of like, no, I don't need to do that. Yeah. You have to know when it's clear. Not when somebody else tells you. 
It might be somebody else telling you, but it's got to be, you got to know it's the Lord when the Lord speaks something to you. He expects to be obeyed. We started off months ago talking about we live in a time of no consequence. See, that's where we're living in America, where it's like, how come everything's going along? You all have enough to eat, right? People are complaining about inflation. It's true, but I'm telling you, Frankie and I and Jason just came back from Central America. You, 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 there's people all over the world with, with going one day to the next because there are consequences, and they're happening every single day as it just builds up and builds up and builds up. God's not mocked, amen? But he's not a harsh, angry God. And he wasn't being harsh here. The young prophet was obedient, but then he was deceived by the old prophet. You better listen to who you listen to, amen? You need to, you need to find men around you that have some oil on their heads, amen? God's got a hold of them. There's got to be that brokenness. So he didn't listen, he was deceived. But aren't you glad that it says in Corinthians, listen to this Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 2 through 13. Bear with me while I read this. For we were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud of the sea and did eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they over, were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples. To the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters, as they were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down and ate and drank. Isn't that what that prophet did? And they rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day 20,000. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted, for they were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur. Man, I was doing good up to that point. How about you? Have you everybody ever been like that? Well, oh, I ain't. I'm not worshiping no golden calf. And I, we always think we're doing, we like measurements. I'm doing really good. And then it's like, and they murmured. It's like, oh, man, man. And we're destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happen to them for an example. For they are written for ad admonition. Somebody say amen. See? Are you now? Maybe, maybe if you get to heaven and that young prophet's there, you could shake his hand and say, thank God. He's going to like, for what? I read that story. It put me on my knees, put the fear of God in me. And you had to go through it, so I wouldn't. Amazing, isn't it? Upon whom the ends of the world are come. That's us. Then it ends with this. Verse 13. There is no temptation taken hold of you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able. Do you believe that? Anybody ever felt like, Lord, I'm at my limit. I can't tell you how many times it's like, Lord, I don't know if you're paying attention, but I'm at my limit. And God's like, no, I know your limit. That's how we get stretched. Amen? That's how we get stretched. Tempered in the battle, as Larry, Brother Larry tells us. Right? We get pulled further than we, we think we can go. God builds that character. But with every temptation will also make a way of escape that you'll be able to bear it. We've talked about that before. He makes a way of escape. Then it says that you'll be able to bear it. So we always just look for escape. Take this off me. God's like, I'll make a way out for you, but you've got to learn to bear this. Amen? This is why we have to understand those authorities, the thing we're walking in. Amen? Some of you are carrying things that you should be letting God carry. Some of you sisters are carrying things you'd be letting your husband carry. Well, I don't think he can carry it. I hate for him to be burdened. That's his problem. Because you brothers, if you're carrying more than you can take, you should be giving it to the Lord. Amen? And there are poor children. Those children that are out there. The things we're teaching them and putting on them, we're telling them they're destroying the world with with climate change. They're, they're putting books in front of them in, in some of these other states. and all we're, we're just burdening these children. Because we don't like that. It's like, that child should just be free. And say, that's my parents' problem. That sister should be free. Say, that's my husband's problem. That's one thing I don't understand. Right? To me, it, submission in the right way always means freedom. Right? When we've been in real trials, I could look at my wife and say, just give it to me. Because she needs to be focused on those kids and, that, and everything that's going on. 
And sometimes she'd walk away and I'd know, "Uh uh-uh, you didn't, you're still carrying it. I could tell when she was carrying it. How? Because there wasn't that freedom. When I see that love was flowing through her and she had that joy and peace, I'd know she just put it on me. Then that mean I had to go to God and tell God, I need, I need some help. And God's like, I'm your father. I'll carry this. Amen. Do we see that this morning? It is so important that God means what he says. Things he's spoken to you personally. What has he spoken to you? It's true. It's true. It may not come out the way you think, but it's true. There's a heaven and there's a hell. It's real and it's true. And God says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you're saved. That's true. Amen? That's true. He'll never leave you, forsake you. That's true. Just think about it in the New Testament. They, they were illiterate, many of the people. They had no Bible. But if the apostle went through and told them, remember what the Word says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Just think they held on to that. That was the Word of God in the New Testament. They didn't have Bibles, many of them. They didn't have YouTube. Sister Martha and Leah just left the meeting talking to each other saying, what did, what did God say? What did Jesus say on the earth? He said He'd never leave us or forsake us. We hang on to that. See, think of, think of the victory the church could walk in if they do that. And yet, we have believers that are their, their, their minds are filled in, 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 with the Word of God. And it's good to be filled with the Word of God, but it's, but it's not real. They're not taking hold of it. Amen. What has God said to you? What has He said to us as a church? He's been speaking things to us. Said we were going to be busy. Telling us to get ready. God's not playing games. Amen. These are examples. It seems a little, a little difficult for me that the old prophet lies. The young prophet gets killed by the lion. What happened to the old prophet? He said, when I die, make sure you put my bones with his bones. Why? Because he knew what the prophet said, that the false prophet's bones would be burned on the altar. He said, put me with him. They won't put my bones up there. See, this guy, was, this guy was worried about himself the whole way through. But that young prophet was an example to all of us. Peter says, Satan is a roaring lion, goes about who he may devour. Amen? So certainly Satan comes against us. Certainly didn't come against, against us. But how many times you meet believers who are like, no, I'm just going to go over there. No, I'm going to live my life like this. I'm going to live like next thing you know, they're, they're calling you. It's like, man, everything's a mess. What's happening? It's like... Didn't God tell you something? Yeah. What did God say? Surrender. Surrender. I need help in my finances. Surrender. I need help in my marriage, my home. Surrender. Are you willing to obey? Yeah. You sit with the couple, they're struggling. It's like they're both Christians. Like, well, are, are you, you love each other. Are we willing to at least hear what God wants? No, I'm, I'm telling you, it's like, okay, we well, have to go find somebody else you can pay to counsel you or something. I don't know. This is ridiculous. We have to be at least willing. Amen. These were examples. And there's a balance to that. And I want, I want that balance this morning. I could have stood here and preached, and maybe I'd have done that when I, 25 years ago, to stood up here and, and, and preached about that lion killing that young prophet and trying to just strike terror into everybody's heart. That's not what God's after. What he's after is he means what he says. And it's an example to us. And we have better promises and better covenant. Amen. Don't you see? We have this story. This young prophet didn't. We have so much. And yet we have a Christian that says, we have so much, and God just, we want a bumper sticker that says, I'm, I'm not perfect, I'm forgiven, or God doesn't care, you know, and we just get by. It's like when you really see what God's given us, then more than ever, God's people should be, we, we're going to obey what God says. We're going to do what He says. We're going to press in more than ever because we've been given so much. Amen? That's why I require some of you gentlemen that are here because I know you've been given much and God's requiring much. Amen? God's requiring more. Amen? And you sisters too. What an example in a world that's gone mad. It gets tough at times, I know. But we've got to obey God. What has He said? Don't move off that word. There's no timetable. If your heart is, God has told me this, 
but I'm going to wait till here, and if he doesn't answer, I'm going to do it my way. Right? I'm going to move out if he doesn't come on my timeline. It's hard to wait. Yeah? It's hard to wait like soldiers as the enemy's bearing down. And you ever see those old movies where it's like, don't move till you see the whites of their eyes. Don't move. It's hard to not do that. It's hard to keep hanging on. But his word is true. Somebody say amen. His word is true. Do you see the privilege we walk in? Do you see the privilege we have? And then I promise you I will end. Do you see our privilege? And this is the peril of privilege. We can preach all day long about how we have a better covenant, how great it is, but no one ever stops and says, do you understand the peril of that privilege? You are blessed beyond blessed beyond blessed. Do not be spoiled. And I put to you this morning that much of Christianity is filled with spoiled children. Spoiled. God doesn't want it. You don't have to be ashamed of what you have. Amen? But you have to be grateful for it. Amen? Some of you won't, even in ministry, won't go through some of the things some of us older ones have gone through. And that's a good thing because you can take from our wisdom, but you got to be grateful. Amen? That's what we want. That's why sometimes when, when, when a, a brother will stand up and say something, if it's a brother, it's like, listen, this isn't just knowledge. This is coming from a place of brokenness. Yeah? Our sister shares something. You know, that's come from trials and, and difficulties and pain. Amen? So we have to end this way. Has God spoken to you? Has it God spoken something to you? Have you moved off of that? Get back to the Word of God. Amen. He loves you and He will bring it to pass. Amen. Let that conviction come in your heart. It's so beautiful. It's like I said, when that pastor looked at me and said, can you take a weekend off? I was so convicted. So convicted. Amen. Even in our discouragement, God knows. He listens to us. But when we start complaining, that conviction should be there. We've got to get back to that. That... That is what the way this generation will be discipled. I'm telling you, they're going to come in and the Holy Ghost is going to get a hold of them. We won't be having to try to convince them. You have to quit this. You have to quit that. We won't be debating. Can you do this? Can you do that? They're going to come in and say, God got a hold of me. God got a hold of me. That's what we need again. Amen. That's what happened to to this young lady and I when we got saved. I'd like to say that. That, that we've had a good marriage because she married a good, handsome Italian boy. That helps, I do believe, but it's because the Holy Ghost came into our house. Amen? He came into our house. And one of us was convicted more than the other one. I'll let you guess which that was. Amen? God means what He says. All of us. All of us should just take a moment and say, thank God I haven't met a line. Amen? Anybody just like, thank God. I mean, it's amazing. All he did was eat and drink. That's how serious God is. But we're in a better covenant. Should we take advantage of that? Or should we tremble in fear and say, God, you're going to do great things. Amen? He's going to do great things. I don't know where else to go with this. Thank you for your patience. I'm all stirred up now because some of this I'm getting as you're getting it. Amen? I have my notes and all and it just ruminates and ruminates and ruminates and keeps me up at night. And then I stand up here and it's like, wow. Yes, Lord. Let's pray and let's do this. The Holy Ghost has spoke to you. You've not listened. You need to repent. You need to say sorry, Lord, and get back to the Word of God. As a church... As a church, what's been our word? From faithfulness to faith. I think we better get back in that faith strongly. Amen? Expectation. Suddenly, all these things God spoke to us. If you've got weary with that, let's believe it. If you're here today and Christ is not your Savior, then if you take a moment and simply in your heart say, Jesus, I need you, God will do the rest.